Lana and I have a good friend uh, who was named a pretty normal name by his parents and was raised with that name, went off to college, and about the time he got to college, there was another guy who became famous with the same name. And so you can imagine people started to equate that name with his. Well, unfortunately, this man did not really represent what he would represent. In fact, it became sort of a source of shame. And, and, and it, it became so daunting to him to have to constantly be associated, affiliated with this other guy. He actually changed his name in college and took another name and has, has gone by that name ever since. That's, that's a pretty amazing thing to have to do, but that's the power of a name. There's something about a name. I want to talk about the power of a name today. We're in the midst of this series on the Ten Commandments, and we're looking today at the Third Commandment, which has to do with preserving the name of the Lord. Would you turn with me to Exodus chapter 20, Exodus 20, second book of the Bible, there at the beginning. If you're new to the Scriptures, then feel free to use your table of contents, or just right there toward the beginning. And um, as you're turning there, let me remind you of a couple of things. We have this coming Sunday another town hall meeting at the North Katy campus. If you're unable to attend the last one, I encourage you to join us up at the North Katy campus Sunday evening at 5 p.m. on September the 10th. And I hope that church family, you're all praying about your role in taking that step of faith as it relates to our gifts and our schedule and our service. I also know many of you are praying with me. You're watching the news about the devastation in Florida. It appears that a lot of the damage has to do with trees, which is right in the wheelhouse of uh, our chainsaw team with the Texas Baptist Men Disaster Relief teams here. So as you pray for Florida, I hope you'll pray for our teams. They are on standby right now and tentatively planning to depart this coming Sunday, uh, sending a team to Florida to help uh, serve in that way. I love being a part of a church where we can go and serve as the hand and feet of Christ in such a tangible way. So grateful for all of you who, who are participating in that. And please join me in praying for them. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7 now. Look at what the scripture says. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God, because the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who misuses his name. In other words, God is supposed to be spoken of in a reverent fashion, a holy fashion, not irreverently, not in an empty way that, that might empty the Lord's name of its meaning. You might think of it this way. Remember we talked about the second command, uh, and the second command really prohibits visual representations of God because there's such a poor representation. In the same way, the third command focuses on inappropriate verbal representations of God. So it's a sign of respect for God. People were to exercise great caution when talking about him or invoking his name. So we don't detract from a true appreciation of his nature and character. Uh, this is an interesting command because of all the commands, it might be the most confused, confusing, not in the sense that we, we grew up, a lot of us, thinking that this just meant you don't use God's name as a cuss word. I understand. But it means so much more than that. And, and that's why I say it might be the most misunderstood. So I can't wait to share with you from the pages of Scripture how significant this really is in our lives. And I am convinced that every one of us could, could experience more awe of the God that we serve, a, a deeper sense of worship and reverence if we'll understand the significance of three truths related to this third command. May I share them with you? Here's the first truth I want you to see. We really have to understand that there's something about that name. We need to recognize, first of all, the importance of the name. Before we can talk about the prohibition, we need to understand the importance of the name. Sometimes we uh, underestimate the importance of any name, don't we? I mean, why is it that you named your children what you named your children? Uh, why did your parents name you what they named you? Do you know? Um, I, I know that we named our three girls basically names that we just thought were pretty and uh, beautiful, or they, they, they reminded us of people that we knew. So when we were naming our children, and by the way, we didn't know whether, before Riley was born, our oldest, whether she'd be a boy or girl. So we, we, uh, we waited for that to be a surprise. So we had to have guys' names ready and girls' names ready. Did some of you do that? And so we went back and forth, and basically, uh, it, it became an arduous process, but we had to go through three filters, at least at our house. Okay, first of all, we eliminated names that reminded us of people we didn't like. Did you do that? Oh, what about this name? No, I went, I went to school with a guy of that name. I couldn't stand him. No, can't do that. 
All right. Remember, Lana taught school before we had kids, so she had all those names. Like, no, 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 not, not naming her that. All right. Second, we eliminated names if they didn't pass the sports announcer test. This was a real test at the Rush House. You had to think about it. I'd take the name, Lana say, what about this? And i say, okay, let's think about it. The announcer's there before the game. And now, starting at power forward, number 32, Riley Rush. Sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah. Reagan Rush, Lily Rush. Yeah, it had to pass the sports announcer test. And third, we eliminated names that could be abused on the playground. <laughs> you had to think about, okay, how can this, does it rhyme with something? Does it, can it be spelled backwards? Can it be, uh, what, are the, what do the initials say? I mean, kids can be cruel. So you have to think through all those things, right? And, and then you come up with a name. Uh, I heard a story about a, a man who was a very successful attorney, but he had to deal with a, a, a name his whole life that he didn't like. His name was Timothy Odd. And he got so tired of that name that he finally uh, wrote in his last will and testament to his family. He said, you know what? I've had to live with this name my whole life. At least in death, I want to remove myself of the name. And so he ordered them very specifically to place a tombstone at his body, his burial site, without his name. He said, the only thing I want on my tombstone is this. Here lies an honest attorney. And even that backfired because for the rest of time, people would walk by and say, now that's odd. <laughs> Poor guy. I happen to know a lot of honest attorneys here at Kingsland, but there's something about a name, right? There's lots of meaning in a name. A name reflects a person's character and his nature. A name in the scripture represented the character of a person. And that's not completely lost on us, right? We, we know the phrase people say when somebody says, I need to clear my name. They're not saying they need to eliminate their birth certificate. It means that they need to take the reputation equated to the name that they've been given and clear that name. We know that. But in scripture, there was always a reason behind the name, always uh, some, some substance behind the name. Uh, we don't tend to do that as much in Western culture, uh, but you go to other cultures. I love the international flavor of our church, and you see this, especially among my friends from Africa, uh, African cultures. There's this beautiful tradition of almost prophetically naming uh, a child based on what they pray the child will become or who she, he or she represents. I was thinking this week about my friends uh, Paul and Hannah Ikua from Kenya, uh, Paul serves in our International People Group's ministry, and they've named their children Precious and Armstrong. So I called him yesterday. I said, I got to know. Like, what's the story behind those? And he said, oh, pastor, I haven't told you. He said, my wife was told that we could never have children. We prayed and prayed. We waited seven years to have a child, but, but four years into that process, the doctor sat us down and said, you'll never have children. You just need to prepare now. And he said, we understood that we were going to trust the Lord's will, but we just were asking God. And he said, I told my wife, let's go ahead and name our child now based on how rejoicing we'll be when the Lord answers this prayer. And so he said, Pastor, we named our daughter Precious three years before she was born because we knew she would be precious in our sight. And then he said, Armstrong, how can you get more masculine than that? Like, Armstrong. I said, I like that, okay. But you see, so many of you have stories like that. And, and also the sense of lineage in your name, right? That it dates back to a part of your family's past. It's a glorious thing. But you need to understand that the name was very significant in the Bible. In fact, there were times when the name of a person in Scripture would actually be changed because their destiny was changed in the midst of their life. So, for example, Jacob was born as Jacob, meaning deceiver, but his heart was changed and his name was changed to Israel, meaning governed by God. Remember Abram, born exalted father, but God changed his name to Abraham, the father of many nations. God changed Sarai to Sarah. God changed in the New Testament, Simon to Peter. In fact, did you know that the scripture tells us that your name will be changed as well? Revelation 2.17 tells us that we're going to get new names as believers in heaven. Listen to what Jesus says. Let everyone who has ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name is inscribed that no one knows except the one who receives it. Isn't that sweet? God has a new name for you. Why? Because your character will change. Your whole sense of presence and person, pers personhood will change in glory. But the ultimate example in Scripture is God himself. 
God's name, listen, God's name is a representation, a full representation of his character. More so than anyone else where it might reflect a little bit of that character, God's name represents his character. Now remember, who's receiving the Ten Commandments? Yes, Israel is. But they're being given to Moses to be given to the Israelites. And as he's receiving that, remember the significance of who that is. Because Moses had to be, had some things going through his mind as he thought about this command about the name. How did Moses first get introduced to God? Does anybody remember? The burning bush, right? He's in the backside of the wilderness. He's been exiled. He's tending his flock. He sees this bush that's burning but is not, is not consumed. And then the Lord appears to him, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. And he commands him to go to Pharaoh, remember, and command Pharaoh to let the people of God go. And so Moses asks a good question of God. Exodus chapter 3, verse 13. Listen to this. Then Moses asked God, if I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What should I tell them? And God replied to Moses in verse 14, I am who I am. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Tell them your God's name is I am. This is the first time that God gives his proper name in the Bible. The word in Hebrew that we pronounce Yahweh could be be translated as the self-existent one. It's so holy in the scriptures that uh, there's a longstanding tradition among the translations, almost any of them that you use, that the word is translated in scripture most often as Lord, capital L, and then capital O-R-D, with a little bit smaller letters. Do you notice that in your scriptures? Why? Because it's just so precious, this idea of of the self-existent one. In other words, he is sovereign over all. Do you see? God's name perfectly equates to his character. Did you know that beyond his proper name, God is ascribed 350 plus names in the scripture? You say, well, why are there so many names? I believe part of that is because We can't get our finite minds around the majesty of the God we serve. And so the Lord reveals himself through these names. Let me share just a few with you that Moses would have been familiar with when he's receiving this command. Just going back through Genesis and Exodus up to the time where he received the commands, we learn something about the majesty of the name of God. Now, I'm about to give you a lot of scriptures in a row, and so I'm going to ask you to do something that's strange from a preacher, okay? There's nothing that thrills the heart of a pastor more than seeing you take notes, some of you taking notes, some of you are faking taking notes when you're really doodling or like you're playing a game on your phone, but you make me feel good because I think you're taking notes. I'm going to ask you to put your pens down for a second because I want, there's going to be a lot of them, and I don't want you to get distracted. I want you to let this rest on your heart, the majesty of the name of God. When Moses received this, no doubt he thought of these passages. I think about Genesis 1-1, when God created the heavens and the earth, his name is Elohim, a reference to God's power and God's might. Or Genesis 2, his name is Jehovah, a reference that God is divine salvation. Or Genesis 16, Hagar is cast out of the camp with Ishmael, but God shows mercy and he's rightly named El Roy, meaning the strong one who sees. Or Genesis 14, Abram meets Melchizedek, king of Salem, and the king proclaims that Abram is blessed by El Elyon, which means the most high God. Or Genesis 17, Abram is invited to live in the presence of God, and God identifies himself as El Shaddai, meaning the God of the mountains, or God Almighty. Or Genesis 22, Abraham takes his only son Isaac to the mountain to follow through with the unthinkable command to sacrifice his son. We know from Hebrews 11, on the other side of the cross, that uh, Abram did this because he believed so fiercely that the God who created the miracle of his son would rescue his son. There he was in obedience, and remember that God provided a ram as a fitting sacrifice and substitute? And so Abraham named that place after another of God's names, Jehovah Jireh, meaning the Lord will provide. 
Or what about Exodus 15? God promises Israel to protect them from the diseases inflicted on the Egyptians, and his name there is Jehovah Rapha, meaning the Lord our healer. Or what about Exodus 17? Israel's delivered from the armies of the enemy, the Amalekites, and he's proclaimed Jehovah Nisi, meaning the Lord our banner. We could go on and on, but do you understand the majesty of this name? What a name. His name reflects his character. And listen, when you understand the majesty of his name and the sense that his name reflects his character, it's amazing how this will unlock all sorts of scriptures for you that you really didn't see in that light that speak of the name of the Lord when you understand you're speaking of his character. Let me give you some examples just from the Psalms for just a moment. Let this rest over you. Psalm 8, verse 1. Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. Psalm 23, 3. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake, or the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Psalm 29, 2 begins, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Or Psalm 34, 3. Proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. Let us exalt his name together. Or Psalm 86, 11, which ends, give me an undivided mind to fear your name. Psalm 103, 1, my soul, bless the Lord, and all that's within me, bless his holy name. Psalm 113, 2, let the name of the Lord be blessed both now and forever. Psalm 124, verse 8, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Or Psalm 135, 13, Lord, your name endures forever. Your reputation, Lord, through all generations. Do you see? His name equates to his character. There's something about the name. In fact, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, do you remember in Matthew chapter 6, how did he begin the prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Or our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. It begins with a reverence, a lifting up of the name. His name is to be consecrated. Why? Because his name represents his character. And if we don't understand that, we're not going to understand the command. Do you see how significant, how much weight there is to that name? This great name. Okay, you can take notes again, by the way. (laughs) That helps us appreciate the command that we find back here in Exodus 20, verse 7. And so let's get to the next truth that I want us to see. We've seen the importance of the name. Now I want you to see the misuse of the name. Many of us are familiar with this command in the King James Version. You should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, there's two words there, take and in vain. The idea of take is to lift up. The idea of vanity is to make it empty, to misuse it. And so, so the, the CSB that I use is a, a right translation to misuse, but it's actually two important words there, to take in emptiness. Um, So God's name, if it's the representative of his character, do you see, when we use his name inappropriately, we're actually maligning the character of God. And there's at least three ways ways I see in Scripture that we can misuse God's name. There's probably more than that, but three foundational ways we see over and over again. Can I share those with you? First of all, we can misuse God's name through profanity. Now, this is the one we're probably the most familiar with, but it means more than just don't cuss using God's name, all right? The idea is in our speech, to profane the name would be to lower it or use it in a base manner. I think about Leviticus 19.12 that says, do not swear falsely by my name, profaning the name of your God, I am the Lord. This may be the most common way, right? So, so the name of God is associated with, uh, with something less than him and sometimes even damnation or the name of Jesus Christ is used in a way that's flippant. Have you ever noticed that when somebody gets angry, even when they're far from God, they use the name of the, the God of the Bible? You don't ever see, you don't hear people using other God's names. It's this one that they focus on. Now, why is that? Now, not to psychoanalyze, but I think the reason why this keeps coming up is because even those who are far from God recognize who he is, okay, in their heart of hearts. And so if you place yourself on the throne and something bad happens, oh, you, you can't blame yourself, all right? So you, you blame that on God. And so there comes out of our mouth this thing from our heart that's this, this, uh, this horrible word. 
And so that's where Jesus gets mixed up in this, the name of Jesus, the name of God, all these things. Can I tell you one thing? As I've looked at the majesty of the name and as I really looked at the scripture this week, forgive me, I'm going to sound like a prude for just a second, all right? When you really take a good look at this, I think this makes it clear we also need to be real wary of the slang terms or, or the, the, uh, the kind of sideways uses of God or the, 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 the words we substitute. Now, we talked about legalism last week. This doesn't mean we need to be the speech police in the hallways, okay? But you know in your heart, I'm just asking you to look in your heart and say, when I say words as a substitute, whether it's gosh or golly or geez, and, and I know some of you are going, what is he talking? I'm t- I, you know in your heart of hearts, is that a substitute in your heart for what you really want to say that's in your heart? And so it's worth praying about when you understand the majesty of the name, right? Consider how your speech reflects your heart. Here's the second way this can happen. We can misuse God's name through deception. So you take God's name and you use it to to make yourself sound better or make something that's far from God sound more legitimate. Um, I think about Deuteronomy 10.20. You are to fear the Lord your God and worship him, remain faithful to him, and take oaths in his name. By the way, that passage says take oaths in his name. There's some people who read this command and say we should never take oaths, like in their court of law say, well, I can't do that. No, we can take oaths. Just don't misuse the oaths that you take. The idea here is that you're taking God's name and you're using it, you're putting it forward in order to justify something you couldn't, you shouldn't. Uh, If you ever go to Israel, you're probably going to take a trip to the West Bank. The West Bank is sort of a political no man's land. east of of, uh, the political Israel, where Israel has control, but has yielded some of that control governmentally to the Palestinian Authority. It's more than you need to know, but what you need to know is in that no man's land, there's not a lot of copyright laws going on. And so you see kind of some funny things because there's no enforcement. And, And when you're going into Bethlehem, I mean, right near the Church of the Nativity, this wonderful site, if you look up on your left, some of you are already smiling that have been there, you see this store called Stars and Bucks. I mean, come on now. We know what you're doing, right? Now, if it's anywhere else in the world, it would be shut down by lawyers, but they can't get there, okay? It's an obvious comical knockoff, but what are they doing? They're trying to legitimize themselves with a loose association with a larger entity. And that certainly happens with God. That's what, that's what we're prohibited to do. Jesus brought this up in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 33 through 37. He says, you should have enough integrity with your words that you don't have to keep attaching God's name to it. Your yes should mean yes and your no should mean no. It's repeated in James 5, 12. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes mean yes and your no mean no so that you won't fall under judgment. Stop misusing God's name or attaching it to make it sound more important. You can find this idea all over in culture, can't you, where we seek to legitimize ourselves by attaching God's brand to something that he really doesn't endorse. Watch an award show. Watch people who who have no affiliation with God would profane his name and then stand up and accept and say, I'd just like to thank God or Jesus. Why are you equating God to that? Politicians sometimes use this. I know that's hard to believe. But there are some politicians who will attach the name of God to legitimize what they're talking about. Or businesses we see do this. Uh, When it's convenient to be Christian, to attach Christianity or a a fish symbol to their thing. We see this especially at Christmas where businesses say all of a sudden, get holy, okay? You can also find this in places uh, where our own lives, where we tend to put ourselves forward and try to legitimize it in that way. It can be dangerous, do you see? Let me show you a third way we can misuse the name of the Lord. We can misuse God's name through hypocrisy. Now, this kind of strikes closer to home and maybe makes it a little bit broader because we understand that if we are representing the Lord Jesus Christ and we poorly represent him, then our hypocrisy is demonstrating a picture of God's name that is less than who he really is. Let me give you a couple of passages here. Jeremiah chapter 14, 14 says, But the Lord said to me, These prophets are prophesying a lie in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them or speak to them. They are prophesying to you a false vision, worthless divination, the deceit of their own minds. In other words, they're saying they're from me. They're not from me at all. 
Listen to 1 Peter 4, 16. Speaking of suffering for the cause of Jesus, it says, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Watch this. Well, let him glorify God in having that name. So in this encouragement to persecuted Christians, he, he reminds us of something very important. If, you, if you're a Christian, if you call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you bear the name of Jesus. So when people see you, that's a picture to them of God. That's a representation of his name. I've shared this before, but when I was a senior in high school, I was driving home one day, and I got pulled over by a policeman in our hometown. I know it's hard to believe, and I'm sure I was innocent. <laughs> but I remember being on the side of the road, thinking through all these things, and the, the officer came up. I rolled down my window. He said, Can I, you know, do you know how fast you were going? No, officer, he told me. And he said, can I see your driver's license and registration? I handed him that. And he looked at it, looked at me, looked at it, looked at me. And he said, Ryan Rush. And he leaned in. He goes, are you Dean's boy? And I thought, man, I did not want to hear that tonight. Because it's one thing, like, he was going to find out if I got a ticket. But the reality was what hurt me even more than the ticket is I was misrepresenting my father's name to some people who thought highly of him. And I did not want to do that, you see. The same thing goes here. With The, the command here is to recognize the majesty of the God that we serve and that we bear the name as believers in Christ. We have seen the importance of the name. We've seen the misuse of the name. And finally, I have some really good news for you. Because as we close, I want you to see the victory of the name. The victory of the name. Now, in order to share this with you, I have to share, kind of go back to some bad news. Because notice this command, just like the second command, comes with a stern warning. It says, because the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who misuses his name. Do you understand? When we talk think about all these ways we can lower the name of God, how ominous that is, you're not going to go unpunished if you misuse the name until we realize that it's by the name of God that actually we've escaped that punishment. You see, through Jesus Christ, we see that his name should not only cause us to be in awe of him, but should cause us to rejoice. Why? His name is a compassionate name. His name is a loving name. I think about a passage we talk a lot about at Christmas time that prophesies about the names of God the Son when Messiah comes. Isaiah 9 verse 6, speaking of the coming Son of God, says, For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus has given us a glimpse of the Lord. We know so much more of the name of God because Jesus has come. Do you see? John 17, 6, in Jesus' high priestly prayer, that's exactly what he says. He says, I have revealed your name to the people you gave me from the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. You see, we have access to God through the one, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And even when we say the name Jesus, do you say we're expressing literally the redemption that we have from that punishment that we deserve? Because the name Jesus literally means Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah is salvation. That's what we're saying. Why? Because no one who misuses the name will go unpunished. Jesus Christ took the punishment for our sin. He took it upon himself. It's no wonder that the scriptures speak of the name of Jesus as the name above all names. In Philippians chapter 2, it says, For this reason God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is no other name like the name of Jesus. His name is not only worth preserving and not cussing about, his name is worthy to be lifted high and to be worshiped and exalted in our lives. Do you see? In fact, there's probably some who came today, and you know in your heart of hearts, you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Yes, you said the name, but you haven't recognized the, the immensity, the weight the depth of his name and what it means. And so you've missed out on that. You can be saved today. How? Through the name of Jesus and what he's done and what it represents. That's why Romans 10, 13 says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Given all that we've seen in the word of God, 
Why would anybody not receive the wonderful gift of grace that only God can offer? I'm aware that many of us have trusted Jesus, and I pray that as we leave here in a few moments, we recognize that we bear a magnificent name in Jesus. Let's bow together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the power of your word. Thank you that we even have this privilege of praying to you right now through the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I pray for the man or woman who maybe came today who hasn't trusted you as Savior and Lord. I pray that today would be that day where they take a step of faith and receive the grace gift that you offer. For all of us, Heavenly Father, we bring our hearts to the throne room, lay them at the altar, God, and we exalt the name. We're in awe of the name. And it's in that name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hey, Pastor Ryan Rush here, and I just want to thank you for being with us at Kingsland Online today. What an honor. But I'll tell you what would be even better. We'd love to see you get connected with the physical church in the days ahead, if you haven't already. And that means maybe if you're local in the West Houston area, we'd love to see you at Kingsland. Otherwise, regardless, we'd love to help you facilitate uh, jumping into a local church near you, and we can do that together. You can go to kingsland.org slash online connect, kingsland.org slash online connect to find out next steps on your journey. Listen, thanks again for being with us today at Kingsland Online.